Okay, well, hello. I think that was Ludmilla saying hello. Hello. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, second quarterly uh, global meeting for the Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility. Uh, my name's Jim Robinson. I'm uh, one of the co coordinators on behalf of uh, NRC and um, I'm really pleased to, to see you here uh, with my colleague Ombretta Tempera with UN Habitat, who you will hear from throughout the meeting as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, really pleased to have you here. Um, just to let you know, we're recording the meeting today, so we will share this up on the HLPAOR website and with those colleagues who are unable to join at this time. Um, just want to share briefly the agenda with you. I'll just put it in the chat so you can see it. Um, uh, but we're going to have uh, some updates uh, from the global side, some of the work that's been happening uh, on the information management perspective. Then we're going to have our colleagues uh, who are with the Gaza HLP Technical Working Group to provide uh, an update. Uh, we'll hear from NRC about the new um, uh, uh, HLP integration work that's happening and some of the products that have been developed with that uh, from Fernando. Um, and then we'll hear uh, from the shelter cluster colleagues on some HLP updates from there. And we'll hear a little bit about the recent HLP in crisis conference in Washington, D.C. Um, and then there's some time, hopefully, for any updates, things you would like to share yourself. Um, yeah, thanks. If you could just mute yourself if you're not talking, that would be great. And at any point, please offer comments in the chat if you want to contribute verbally um, or through some kind of dance, then feel free to raise your hand and we'll come to you. Um, and yeah, but that's that's the plan for the session today. Um, so first, I am going to pass to my colleague uh, Trezor um to uh, give us uh, a short update on some of the work he's been involved with uh leading the hlp aor's task team um on sort of developing pin and severity guidance looking at indicators acknowledging the fact that we haven't had a, a kind of a coherent uniform sort of guidance on this approach um and um, yeah trezor's leading that work and of course you're all still very welcome to get involved with that um, but i'll hand over to trezor for an update and uh, yeah, over to you, Trezor. Um, thank you, Jim. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, try to share my screen. So I've changed the, the, the order uh, of my slides. Sure. So instead of uh, starting uh, on the task team, I'll start uh, by giving you an update um, on the Frank von um, HLP meeting that we had uh, last month. Um, so on 23rd of, of May, we had um, our first uh, HLP quarterly meeting in French. And um, the primary uh, objective of of this meeting is to facilitate um, um, experience uh, sharing uh, among HLP uh, coordinators from the region. So most of them, uh, they are French uh, speakers, but also we have included uh, Burundi in the discussion because even if um, they are not uh, from the Central and, and West Africa region, but at least um, it's a French country as well. And also, um, I would like to thank Emma, uh, who updated uh, the whole group on the eviction platform portal, actually uh, being developed by NRC in, in DRC. So this platform um, is currently uh, being rolled out. And also, uh, during that meeting, we had uh, the presentation of this tool as well. Um, and then just to end uh, this point, it was also a great pleasure to have uh, HLP coordinators from the sub subnational level attending uh, this meeting as well. Yeah. So now I will give you an update on the task team. Um, if this is your first time to hear about the task team, uh, it's important to know that this task team has been uh, put in place to develop a methodology that would allow um, 
to have a, meteor a meteorology that can be used to estimate the people it needs and severity for uh, for each LP uh, during the humanitarian program cycle. Uh, the third theme is launched for six months and, and it, it started in, in April. Um, so last uh, in the last week we had our second meeting. So we remain having uh, um, again uh, for additional meeting. Actually, the task team is shared by by uh, NRC, but uh, we still have uh, a vacancy for for any uh, organization that will be interested in co-sharing the task team uh, as well. The task team actually um, has around um, around uh, twenty members, and these uh, come come uh, from different. Uh, Clusters. We have uh, members from uh, protection cluster, uh, shelter cluster, and also um, impact um, initiative as well. And uh, the task team actually uh, meet uh, monthly, but in between the, the month, uh, there are some ongoing uh, activities that members are working on before uh, the next the next meeting. Um, so. It, it is also important to highlight that uh, uh, the task team committed to draw from any uh, existing uh, experience, and this is the reason uh, we requested for different uh, requested um, uh, some operations to share with us uh, any resources or any existing methodology that they have been using in the past uh, to, to estimate uh, the pin and severity for for HLP. Actually, we have received. Uh, Inputs from Cameroon, Somalia, and, uh, and Nigeria, and also we had also uh, some resources that were shared by uh, Impact Initiative, and also uh, by the Protection Cluster um, as well. And uh, in addition to that, now we have um, a subgroup of the of the task team member who uh, volunteered to review uh, any existing methodology uh, that uh, exists, and this subgroup uh, met on 28th of May. And um, during uh, this um, meeting of the subgroup, the subgroup uh, thought that it will be uh, important to identify uh, what aspect of HLP can be uh, assessed before uh, deciding on on how you will uh, design uh, your your response. So, just to give you a, a background, um, uh, among the resources that we we have received. We received also some uh, um, indicators extract from from uh, impact initiative, and and when we were looking we were looking at the way to to organize uh, indicators. Then we thought that before uh, before doing that, it would be important just to to um, think on what's are the aspect that we should uh, be looking at uh, before even uh, uh, choosing any uh, indicators. And from that uh, impact initiative suggested a kind of uh, uh, brainstorming of of a uh, conceptual work. And this uh, and the initial idea uh, was to have this uh, conceptual framework with three uh, pillars, uh, security of tenure, access to land and property, and also uh, damage uh, to property. And then uh, this also was discussed in the last uh, task team uh, meeting, and most of the task team members uh, thought that uh, the conceptual framework would be good uh, for HLP because it would help us to highlight uh, which area of HLP uh, to assess uh, during the response planning uh, phases. And also, uh, we thought that uh, these three pillars that were initially uh, suggested, they would not be uh, enough. And um, we thought that also it would be uh, interested if we, we could have a dedicated uh, session uh, in person in Nairobi just to work on this uh, conceptual framework. So the idea here is to group uh, which are the uh, the aspect we should uh, look at uh, during the um, response uh, planning phases and also to see what are the indicators that uh, can be used in order to contribute uh, to those uh, thematic as well. So as the next step, um, as I said earlier, uh, so we will dedicate an in-person session to brainstorm the HLP conceptual framework 
uh, during the protection conference uh, uh, that will take place in Nairobi. And also we will do also our best to make sure that for those who will not be uh, present in Nairobi, they should also uh, participate uh, online. That's all for me, thank you. Thanks so much, Trezor, and uh, thanks for those updates. And a, a couple of comments from my side and then uh, open if anyone had any question or, or response. So firstly, on this, the task team looking at pin and severity guidance and this uh, you know, discussion around developing a conceptual framework. If people would like to be involved in that, you are still very, very welcome to join. Um, as Trezor mentioned, there's already a, a vibrant, active group from from different kind of clusters and perspectives, and and, and organisations that you know, such as Reach as well, involved. So, if you would like to be involved, please just let us know, and you can be uh, included on the uh, meeting invites and uh, receive updates and things as well. Uh, maybe just drop a note in the chat. Um, but this is, um, you know, part of a, a wider effort to help support our coordinators in country to be able to do their work more effectively and uh, uh, more in a more supported way. So that's ongoing. Um, on the francophone meeting that happened, so that was initially has been for uh, coordinators um, and co-coordinators, and it was great to be able to have some some of our colleagues who are coordinating at the subnational level join that as well. Um, but there could be scope for opening this up a little bit wider if people are interested to join. So again, you know, let us know about that. This is a, a new thing we're trying to uh, push and support. So um, let us know if you'd be interested to, to uh, find out more, be involved in that as well. Um, I just wanted to mention quickly uh, the Global Protection Cluster uh, conference that's happening next week. Um, so some of you will be joining us there. The invite has gone out to um, those HLP coordinators and co-coordinators. Um, and we should have a, a group of around 20 joining us there. Um, just, find that person and uh, mute them. So, um, yeah, so we'll have a, a group joining us there. And we, we will have spent time together with the other AOR coordinators, the other area of responsibility coordinators, child protection, GBV, uh, mine action and the protection cluster. Uh, we'll have two dedicated days to HLP where we will be um, uh, looking at a different number of items around coordination, but also looking at like the impact of climate change on our work and, and how we're responding to that, uh, working in customary settings and a, a chance to share each other's work. And I'm sure we will have some uh, outputs and updates following that in the in the next meeting. Um, we'll also have a, a number of uh, sort of workshops that do deep dives into protection related issues again there'll be more uh, coming out of that for you to uh, read and consider as well and um, before moving on to the next part just wanted to um, invite on Bretta to give us uh, an update uh, from the, the sort of maybe a bit of the sort of the global perspective some of the things that are happening particularly based around the experience at the, the World Bank land conference last month um, on Bretta over to you Thanks, Jim, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you. Um, um, yes, so uh, for actually I'm happy also to see some of those who were there a couple of weeks ago at the World Bank Land Conference, uh, which, uh, you know, is, a, let's say, the main the one of the biggest global conferences for the land community uh, that uh, hasn't taken place uh, in the last four years it was suspended during covid and this session was actually um, the new start after a long break and also there were some changes in format uh, attendance etc um, so i would like just to bring back some of the considerations from that conference, knowing that uh, obviously there were very many sessions happening in parallel and uh, uh, there was also like a research track happening in parallel and uh, of course it was impossible for anyone to be in all the session at the same time. I think some of the outcomes will also be shared, uh, but I will be then inviting maybe some of the people who are in the call to add or complement uh, from their perspective. Um, the HLP AOR uh, was involved in organizing um, a session on uh, tenure security in crisis, uh, which was meant uh, to bridge a little bit the thinking uh, between the humanitarian and development actors working on land um, and uh, present some of the 
work done and discuss some of the key themes. Um, this was quite successful, I would say, uh, to, to achieve this objective. There were different tracks within that uh, session. Uh, one was on land and climate, which uh, looked at it from the perspective of uh, looking at the impact of climate change on housing, land and property rights, then looking at the impact of HLP uh, dynamics and conflict on climate action and also uh, see what's the impact of climate action in uh, you know in effective and in affecting and impacting the housing land and property rights uh, of communities on the ground um, I think the discussions were quite interesting and we would like actually to to bring them back some of them uh, next week as well, uh, and also to learn maybe from from other colleagues how that plays out in their specific context. Uh, there will then a track on protection, uh, um, again looking at the protection and housing land and property rights, uh, looking at the sh short and long term um, concepts and dynamics. Uh, particularly, we zoomed in in uh, two contexts: Gaza and Somalia. Uh, trying to, you know, to to to, sh to see the the different aspects to be taken in consideration, uh, longer term action, but also immediate needs. Uh, and for example, quite a lot of discussion took place around housing, land, and property rights related to debris management, uh, and what can actually, particularly in the case of Gaza, be done on the short term. Uh, there was a tract on shelter and settlements, uh, and one on post displacement looking at you know how to then uh, address these challenges and uh, i think discussion revolved quite a lot on uh, the needs and how to as a humanitarian uh, you know build on tenure records database in context where there is an absence of it um, I mean, obviously, a lot more to be said, and others welcome to contribute. Uh, but I mean, a little bit more now, reflecting on broadly on the conference, uh, I, I I found it very interesting, also because the last one happened um, exactly four four years ago. So there was quite a lot of shift that that I've seen uh, from that time to this one. Um, I think there was really an attempt that, I mean, the main theme was obviously to, uh, land related in, in the context of climate change. So there was really an attempt uh, of the land community to really think in relation to, to climate um, action, climate's consideration, implication, etc. cetera. Um, and obviously, you know, this, sort of interaction between climate experts and land experts and trying to find a middle ground and also combining the different narratives on the topic. Um, in a way, there was also an attempt made by several of the actors to also look at the finance aspect, uh, although I think this probably will come through a bit more in the future where, you know, a lot of the financial compensation mechanisms, for example, get better structured. Um, there was a big comeback, I would say, of community consideration of community land rights or group rights, uh, particularly because um, it's clear that this type of group rights, as opposed as individual land rights, are better serving uh, the environmental, the achievement of environmental goals, for example, the protection of forests, etc. Um, and uh, I think this is an area that the humanitarian community needs to look more into and understand better their implication. I think a lot of the work we do is tends to look at individual or household level, while some of these aspects are actually uh, could be better treated at the community level. Um, also, uh, again, we saw that even when climate discussion, climate action uh, intervention uh, take place in, in countries is an additional element that pushes away power from the communities, because now there is all range of actors uh, like the, uh, you know, the, the polluting companies, for example, trying to compensate offset their, uh, you know, carbon emission. Uh, there is all a new trend of private actors or companies trying to bridge these gaps, and uh, and this is 
quite a complex um, topic for states uh, to regulate and for community to understand. Uh, and this is an, a trend that is interesting to, to, to interact for us and also see how the carbon credit markets, for example, or, or the loss and damage funds mechanism will impact, in fact, the displacement of people. Um, maybe lastly, uh, I think another big comeback was the, of the land use trend. I mean, of course, a lot actually in the past, the land conference focus on land tenure security. Of course, we all know that land use is also key, uh, but I think, you know, as link, linking uh, land with environmental consideration and climate consideration, climate resilience, uh, there was a lot more effort on on land use, uh, sustainable land use, land use mechanism, uh, also in support of land restorations. Um, and lastly, I mean, uh, I compared to previous conference, I see that mo much more fragmentation of the land community. Uh, and again, uh, you know, maybe more traditional actors having less uh, prominence and then a lot more happening at the le level of foundation, companies, private sectors, uh, like a lot of non-conventional actors that maybe we we'll have to also learn to work with much more at the level of humanitarian community. Um, a lot more to be said, maybe back to you, Jim, and then uh, some of the colleagues that were there might want to briefly add. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Ombretta, and thanks for that that overview. And and yeah, really helpful to remember where like our our work and our role, which might primarily be in humanitarian response, also is part of this wider uh, work and effort on responding to uh, crises relating to land in in some way. Um, yeah, would would anyone uh, like to uh, comment? Um, any questions or um, uh, response in, to that particularly? Um, uh, there'll also be a little bit of space towards the end if you would like to um, as well. But um, if anyone would like to react now, you're very welcome. OK, we'll leave it for now, but please do um, feel free to write comments on the chat. Do you agree? Uh, anything else you would add? Um, OK, uh, so next on the agenda, um, invited our colleagues working uh, with the um, fairly newly formed um, Gaza Housing, Land and Property Technical Working Group uh, to give an update. Uh, so Natalia and Ahmad, if you'd like to maybe briefly introduce yourselves and then um, over to you. Hello everyone, I will, I will turn my camera off in a second because I'm using mobile internet. I'm Natalia Kubowska, I'm with NRC and I'm uh, should be technical working group for Gaza coordinator. Um. Thanks. This is Ahmed from uh, UN Habitat Palestine. Uh, if you allow me, I will have uh, a short introduction as a way of framing and then hand over to Natalia for more details. Um, so good afternoon, good morning, everyone. I'm here uh, with uh, Natalia from NRC to present an update on the HLP issues in the Gaza Strip provided by the technical working group, the HLP technical working group. Well, un unfortunately, with the wide uh, widespread destruction in the Gaza Strip um, uh, has led to significant damages, you know, with current uh, estimates increasing, indicating over 30 million tons of debris, including 4 million tons for damaged roads, uh, alluding to um, affecting, you know, individual and collective rights in the context of the Gaza. Uh, strip. The operational environment is further complicated by the presence of over 1.7 million IDPs, uh, especially South Gaza. This dire situation also has led to loss of property boundaries, destruction of property records, and has escalated land-related disputes at the local, at the local level. Well, uh, with the ongoing military activities, also um, a complex legal landscape is confronted um, in addressing HLP rights, uh, hindered by the lack of, co of course, of functioning government, particularly, uh, particularly land administration authorities and judiciary systems, which are crucial for solving these uh, issues. 
Our strategy focuses on a phased approach, addressing immediate humanitarian needs while laying the ground work for long-term recovery and rebuilding of HIV systems in the Gaza Strip. This includes, of course, providing technical support for debris management, supporting systems for documenting and registering land and properties, and facilitating legal assistance on HIV rights, amongst others. Natalie will provide more details in a minute. Um, maybe finally, I would like to thank everyone, uh, especially on Britta and Jim, uh, for uh, your collaboration as we strive to address these critical issues. Thanks and over from my side. Hi again. Um, shall I share my screen? Can you see it? Yes, we see it. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Ahmad. You uh, already gave a brief overview on the situation uh, in Gaza, and I'm sure most of us, if not all, are aware about it. Uh, I will then uh, just keep the context. It just I cannot. My slides are not. Oh, no, they're moving. Right. So uh, escalation, um, displacement uh, is further aggravated by uh, limited access to land for shelter, including conflicts between uh, owners of the private land and people settling on their land. At the same time, uh, while uh, focus is on humanitarian response, there is a shared recognition of uh, importance of timely planning, preparation, coordination to ensure sustainable recovery and um, reconstruction initiatives. Uh, when we say early recovery, we uh, mean uh, debris removal, waste management, mine clearance, uh, rapid uh, shelter solutions, uh, and uh, these um, initiatives uh, naturally will prompt a lot of um, HLP issues, uh, like loss of property boundaries, uh, loss of uh, ownership documentation, and destruction of uh, rec records, disputes. Uh, and it's fair to anticipate that subsequent uh, reconstruction efforts, uh, such as rebuilding, uh, including utilizing of rubble as construction materials, uh, will uh, escalate the uh, HLP issues and uh, probably will add uh, more to the already quite long list. Uh, with uh, these considerations in mind, uh, Plus three months ago, uh, NRC, UN Habitat, um, Global HLP AOR, as well as Leads of Protection and Shelter Cluster for uh, Palestine uh, came to the decision to uh, establish an HLP technical working group. Uh, at the moment, it uh, sits under the legal task force and uh, therefore it, it's uh, uh, placed at the moment on the protection uh, cluster with very strong links to the shelter cluster. There is a um, uh, possibility of uh, establishing uh, formal HLPOR uh, depending on the context and situation on the ground. Uh, it is led by NRC and uh, UN Habitat is co-chairing. We meet um, every two weeks. Uh, we don't have at the moment formal membership. We are mindful of uh, limitations uh, which all actors in Gaza are facing and we didn't invite people to commit uh, to uh, active participation, but yet we see a lot of interest in uh, many organizations, uh, representatives of clusters, working group adjoining our meetings, uh, contrib contributing through uh, presentations, um, initiating certain discussions. So uh, formal membership is not yet there, but it's uh, it's an option. Uh, of course, the provision of HLP support uh, in Gaza uh, response uh, complicated due to several factors. Uh, Matt already mentioned ongo ongoing military activities, uh, scale of displacement, uh, landscape governing HLP in Gaza, which was always complicated uh, even before the escalation, lack of uh, functioning authorities, uh, judicial systems, etc. Uh, yet we have a strategy. And again, as was mentioned, it's more a phased approach when uh, we address immediate humanitarian needs, uh, but also laying the ground for further uh, recovery and uh, reconstruction efforts. Uh, like you, you can 
look at the slide, you will see that we have uh, like before ceasefire and after ceasefire uh, activities or ideas. Uh, at the moment, we focus on uh, protection risks associated with uh, with HLP and uh, large scale so-called evacuations, um, which basically means people repeatedly moving from one side to another. Uh, we actively engage in planning uh, to prepare for uh, upcoming responses, um, hopefully. Uh, and uh, uh, we do our best to provide guidance and advice and also um, capture the learning from our diverse participants, not limited to Palestine. Uh, recently, we had a presentation uh, of um, HLP solutions related to the mining in Iraq, for instance. So that's that's uh, what we do at the moment. Um, and uh, uh, after the ceasefire, we would like to continue with uh, technical support for interventions, uh, um, promote the due diligence, uh, focus on advocacy. I will move to the next slide, the last one. Uh, it's a long list of activities. Uh, some are um, ongoing, uh, some are work in progress. I will not go through all of them, but uh, again, as I said, we, we already have regular meetings uh, with uh, quite active uh, engagement and participation from uh, stakeholders. Um, we uh, have established quite strong communication channel channels among participants. Uh, we uh, see that there is a quite um, good understanding that HLP considerations have to be uh, integrated in humanitarian and further um, planning. Uh, we collaborate actively with the shelter cluster. Recently, we developed a document. It's it's very brief. It's it's called HLP brief. It's basically meant for a shelter and site management colleagues uh, with uh, uh, do, do's and don'ts uh, on um, uh, HLP, uh, which uh, we can provide at the moment, considering the extremely complicated context in Gaza. Uh, we, um, we we didn't do launch yet any assessments, but we hopefully will. Uh, we, uh, of course, uh, very uh, mindful of uh, um, advocacy messages on uh, collecting them and eventually engaging with policymakers, donors, etc., to raise uh, awareness um, about HLP issues in Gaza. And uh, yeah, training sessions are also something uh, yet planned. Uh, we are working on our own capacity to to do so, and also, of course, the, the con uh, conditions in Gaza are probably not yet ideal to to conduct trainings. But uh, this is this is an activity we would like to pursue in the next several months. Over from my side, I think Ahmed and I can can uh, um, answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Natalia. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, any questions, uh, comments, response? Um, yeah, Sama, please come in. If you just briefly introduce yourself and then, yeah, carry on. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, everyone. Uh, this is Sama, you inhabited Yemen. Uh, thank you, Natalia and Ahmed, uh, for the presentation. I, I think it's, it's great and important work that you're doing. I'm very happy to see that. Um, maybe I've missed it. But uh, could you elaborate a bit on maybe lessons learned uh, and best practices from before the conflict, if you have taken that into consideration, and how that maybe uh, feeds or fed into your into your strategic planning, and uh, also if you would require any any support from 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 other uh, countries. Um, I mean, this is now maybe uh, on a rather personal level, of course. I, I'd be willing to to support and help and. Uh, again, something very important that you're doing. So, um, thanks, thanks for that. And back over to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, maybe Apple. I'll just take a couple of others, um, and then we can come back to you. Okay, Natalia and Ahmad uh, on Breta. Yes, thanks, Tim, uh, and thanks, Natalia and Ahmed, for the presentation. Um, I think. Uh, you know, obviously the context is very challenging from multiple perspective, uh, but here I would say in my 
opinion, the, the key value that this group constitutes is to be a place where all the actors uh, that, that all the actors that are thinking uh, HLP or thinking intervening at certain point of the Gaza crisis with activities that have HLP implication could come together. Um, because really virtually every single forums that uh, we are part of, we know that there are either individual organizations or individual countries or individual people who really feel they should do something about Gaza and then want to, 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 to come in. And definitely, I mean, obviously the situation at the moment is uh, is what we know it is, but I think as soon as there will be ceasefire, uh, hopefully soon, um, the amount of stakeholders that will come into an un uncoordinated manner will be really unprecedented, also considering the size of the, the area we are talking about. Uh, and I think one of the values and probably, you know, key, key roles that this group can be is try to to provide a platform to, I wouldn't even say try to coordinate, but at least inform other actors that are planning to come in of what's going on and who else is there and what are the plans and provide a forum to actually get and exchange information. Um, and uh, this will definitely be a challenge that goes increasing as as uh, will go increasing uh, on as we move forward. So perhaps, um, yeah, maybe to steer further. I mean, I think that the activities are really very good and very relevant, but maybe it will be great perhaps to bring in somebody who has lessons learned exactly as Summer was saying on, you know, like come in and coordinate uh, on this this um, level of challenge of number of stakeholders, perhaps Ukraine could also provide an opportunity because in a way could be a, comp a different but comparable level of fragmentation, I would say, of response. Thank you, over. Thanks, Ombretta. Um, Miriam, we'll just take your point and then we'll go back to Natalia and Ahmad for a response. Miriam, over to you. Thank you, Natalia and Agme, for the presentation and all the work uh, you do. The question is related to the coordination or the work with the uh, mining action part of the protection cluster. To what extent that is happening and can help with the debris management and clearance of sites, including from an HLP perspective. Thank you so much. Over. Thanks, Miriam. So uh, back to you, Natalia and Ahmad, on uh, lessons learned and wider coordination efforts and mine action. Should I come first, Natalia? Sure. Uh, just quickly, of course, Natalia will uh, provide more details. Thanks, colleagues, for your feedback. Uh, Samer, uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, this is not the first war in Gaza, and we have many experiences uh, dealing with HLB violations there. Of course, uh, scale uh, of the damage is uh, unparalleled this time. But uh, even on programmatic level, an RCU and Habitat uh, provided HLB support to Palestinian communities in Gaza and authorities before. Of course, we need, of course, to step uh, uh, the efforts and uh, scale up the efforts uh, as we go forward. But there are a lot of lessons learned uh, from the context of Gaza itself and from the region that we are looking at. And uh, of course, any support from your side and others would be always welcomed. Um, Umbrita, of course, um, uh, yeah. Uh, as you remember last week uh, in the discussion uh, under the Arab Land Initiative, there has been a lot of uh, offers from um, um, Arab partners uh, to provide support to HLB issues in Gaza. How to frame that within the ongoing humanitarian crisis is also a challenge. Um, but as you have uh, said, hopefully a post-conflict uh, or even after the ceasefire, things could be clearer. And uh, very important for us uh, to be reminded that uh, this should be embedded within, within a Palestinian vision. Uh, we need to interact with Palestinian uh, leaders uh, uh, and, of course, uh, uh, representatives of communities uh, in doing so, which is a bit of uh, 
difficult situation now, as you can uh, uh, gather. Uh, Mariam, um, there is a, a designated technical working group on DB management uh, already with uh, Mine Action. Of course, uh, from our side, the UN Habitat, we are supporting at least in terms of quantification with UNEP on the pre uh, issues. Uh, but we do a lot of uh, discussion and coordination, uh, and we're trying to ha to have uh, uh, one, uh, you know, uh, consolidated uh, vision or maybe work plan uh, because of the uh, huge, you know, damages that uh, Gaza is facing. But uh, um, uh, it was it, uh, this uh, designated uh, debris management, uh, the Greek Worker Group just had uh, it's uh, first meeting a couple of weeks ago, but we will be engaging, I think, Natalia with them very soon as well on HLB issues. But um, in our capacity on Habitat, we are providing this linkage uh, at least, but it will be more institutionalized uh, in the near future. Thanks and over from my side, Natalia, please. Hi, thanks. Uh, just a few points on uh, lessons learned. Like I. NRC, for instance, the ECO program, the legal assistance program has phased out in Gaza before the war. So we, we can utilize uh, this less, le lessons learned from our program and not that much. But at the same time, uh, we are actively engaged with UNDP and other actors who were there. Uh, this is also um, related to mine action and uh, uh, maybe not less, to less extent to mine, mine action, but at least uh, uh, just Recently, uh, UNDP proposed to form a committee on uh, discussing uh, solutions for dispute resolutions in, in Gaza after the ceasefire. So we, we do uh, utilize the lessons learned, let's say, uh, of, from other uh, actors actively engaged in HLP Technical Working Group. Uh, Umbrata, thanks for uh, emphasizing on uh, this uh, very important role of uh, HLP uh, Technical Working Group uh, as a platform for um, upcoming uh, actors. And yeah, it's true, maybe we're not going to be always able to coordinate uh, and maybe not all actors will, will, will need that or uh, come to us, but uh, at least we will we'll, we'll be there. And uh, hopefully by the moment uh, when um, this initiative starts, uh, we will have uh, some um, good presence and uh, uh, we will have at least capacity to coordinate uh, if uh, if it's uh, an option. Uh, and the, the last one on my action, like uh, our last uh, meeting was 100% my action uh, uh, HLP um, topic. Uh, we um, uh, invited uh, the mine action colleagues and uh, the, the entire hour basically was about discussing uh, what could be possible uh, HLP issues and uh, solutions as well. Uh, they presented uh, the uh, Iraq experience and uh, we definitely gonna utilize this one. So uh, yeah, absolutely mine action is in, involved, integrated in HLP uh, technical working group uh, discussions uh, and if if you feel curious, I can share with you the um, meet, minutes meeting and presentation on the last meeting June fourth, last Tuesday, this Tuesday. Actually. Over. Jim. Thanks, Natalia. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I there's someone else has also asked about how they might um, sign up to keep informed. So I don't know if there's a, a mailing list for the meeting notes, those kind of things that they could find out about as well. Um, while I saw your hand raised, I'm afraid we need to move on for the just to keep in time with the agenda. But if you'd like to write your question or comment in the chat, please, then uh, Natalia and Ahmad can have a look at that um, as we go, um, if that's OK. Um, thank you. I'm going to turn now to um uh, fernando um who's going to share about a, a new um yeah some work that's been happening within nrc and a new um a product that's come out of that um and we're also going to hear from a colleague working in cameroon uh, that sort of gives a bit of a case study based on some of that that work fernando over to you thanks jim and uh, good afternoon and or good morning to everyone um yeah, yeah, back. So uh, I'm going to present uh, very briefly a product that has come out of the work we are doing with the NRC program activities that are not uh, uh, legal protection. As many of you may know, inside NRC, the work on housing and land property has primarily done by our legal protection program, ICLA, 
but in recent times we are making additional efforts to ensure that uh, we can um, mainstream uh, housing and land property in the other uh, programmatic sectors in the organization. Initially, it was a product uh, for internal consumption, uh, but we thought once that it was finished that it was a good idea just to share it with the broader community because we suspect that many are struggling with the same type of issues that we were trying to address with uh, developing this this uh, this infographic as we have called it and the main objectives that we had initially was to illustrate first of all why and how is housing land and property relevant to each and every individual programmatic area in nrc livelihoods food security wash shelter and settlements, uh, education even, and also our other protection program, protection from violence. But most importantly, to also show how HLP is a connecting element or a connecting dimension between the different uh, programmatic activities, right? And uh, maybe starting to develop uh, a new concept uh, and um, Hold your breath there. A uh, centrality of HLP, maybe, and not just centrality, centrality of uh, of protection, which will be nice, I guess. Uh, I'm preaching to the converted in this group already. But then, um, besides that, we also try to to explore and in, in in a simple way and to explain how is HLP relevant across the different phases. We just heard the colleagues from Gaza, but we know very well that HLP is key for durable solutions and a key element within the the nexus discussions. Um, and lastly, one challenge that we always have, uh, and many in this group have been discussing it before, is that when we come to discuss housing and land property issues, we generally use a very difficult language, very legal, complicated, and we were particularly challenged to come up with something that was simple enough for non-housing and land property experts to also uh, be able to understand. The product is available online now in the NRC website, so you are welcome to check that there. I can put the link afterwards. Then uh, before we we move on to Julius from Cam our colleague in Cameroon, who is going to you know, explain how actually all what I've just said happens uh, in practice, let me show you very briefly the four or five pages that uh, that we, we have in the infographic. Let me share my screen. Did you see? No. Not yet. Coming. Tension is building. How about that? Did you see? Oh, yes. Yeah. I think it's a bit heavy. So basically, uh, very briefly, uh, and you can take a look uh, at it more in detail later since we have now made it available. What we try to do is well come up with very simple why uh, is housing and property important, right? Uh, and why ignoring it will create a lot of harm, but also then going into the details of how is HLP relevant for each and every uh, in every sector. And I mean, these are NRC uh, activities, but I guess that that could be applicable maybe with other specifics to activities that other um, other organizations are also doing within these sectors or within other sectors. And then I was talking about the centrality of, of, uh, of HLP. Uh, so this is how we have tried to, to make the connections between the six program areas in the, in the organization. It looks a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle with bubbles. Uh, so you have to sort of uh, move your way across it. Um, but uh, it actually is quite helpful, especially for someone that has a broader responsibility, program director, head of programs type of, 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 of person to understand how HLP in fact is a connector between the different, uh, the different areas. And it is not only that it adds value, but if we do not address it, the outcomes of our programs may not be achieved. Also with some Easy definitions taken from what is a standard in the sector, and then a little bit of uh, of an insight into the HLP uh, issues, but throughout the displacement phases. And of course, we are talking about it from a displacement angle, but that could also be done from uh, an emergency or not, not an emergency, but a from a humanitarian perspective or from a durable solutions perspective. Anything that uh, that could work for the particular profile of an organization. 
We also illustrate a little bit how the coordination works and where is it located and what is it that uh, that it contributes to the programs. And lastly, we have some examples from our times the offices illustrating how is it how are things coming to practice within NRC. Um, and that's it. And you know, I I still it's very recent. We we had a draft that we used in the at the World Bank conference. Some parts of it and we share with some colleagues there. Uh, we haven't really yet um, uh, experienced or having a good feedback from our colleagues inside NRC, but also from others. Especially, I mean, I think that it is quite comprehensive, but especially on this other objective of ours to be able to illustrate the centrality of HLP to non-HLP actors, something that uh, it seems we keep on struggling uh, time and again uh, within our uh, our area of expertise. So uh, having said that, if any of you eventually when you see it want to engage and send me any uh, any comments about it also from your perspective, I will be very happy. We may not reopen uh, the process of revising this maybe until a few months have passed, but I'm always happy to hear and to receive uh, any comments on, on this. So I'll stop sharing and I think that uh, it will be interesting to hear now Julius um, from Cameroon, which is one of the case, uh, the country office examples we have used to to hear how have, um, you know, the theory that we have put together in this infographic is also uh, being uh, carried out in practice in the field. So Jim, with that, I'll stop sharing and pass it over to you. Thank you. How oh, I stop sharing now? Um, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fernando. Uh, good afternoon. And good morning. Uh, good evening to you, whatever time it may be at your end. Um, thank you, Fernando, for actually introducing the HLP integration and how it happens uh, within NRC. So I would be very glad to share with colleagues. Uh, the um, example or best practices from, from Cameroon. So, in fact, I was talking about an 18-month project that we had, we implemented with grants from the European Union, and this was a multi-sector project bringing together um, protection, specifically on HLP, um, wash and livelihood and food security. So um, under HLP, um, ICLA, uh, that's the ICLA core competency of NRC, had as a goal to ensure that people could enjoy their rights to have improved access to, to land with a secure tenure. While uh, the LFS, Livelihood and Food Security, uh, had as objective to uh, help displacement affected populations to resume agricultural activities to um, actually, uh, you know, for economic reasons and also for subsistence. And at the same time, under the same project, we had our WASH colleagues uh, who uh, had to improve on the flow of portable water and hygiene in the same communities through the construction of uh, hand washing stations. Um, um water points and of course uh, other wash facilities so the integrated approach was very important here if we had to meet the general objective of the project so firstly with um uh, wash icla colleagues actually carried out um a due diligence and this was done with uh, wash colleagues to identify the true owners of the land that uh, would be used for these constructions and also to carry on proper negotiation uh, of this land. And so WASH and ICLA colleagues actually went to the field, identified this land and uh, met with uh, land owners to, to discuss uh, more on how proper land transfer could be done. So in this, um, the what ICLA actually developed a tool which was kind of used to, you know, work with the local authorities. And during the land negotiation process, we invited local authorities. We explained the project and its objectives. And of course, um, those who had the, the land within the communities opted to cede the land to 
um, the community for this uh, construction. And of course, um, we had to proceed also to making sure that proper land transfer was done. So ICLA colleagues also facilitated the documentation and the agreement between the landowners um, for proper transfer to the communities. And of course, that is how the um, colleagues, um, wash colleagues proceeded with the construction of the hand washing stations and that worked very well. Um, with LFS, livelihood and food security, the livelihood and food security is hard to provide um, seats and farm input equipment to displaced persons to resume their agricultural activities. And uh, it was also very important that these people secure access to, to land, not only land, but fertile land. So, so it was also very important for some kind of due diligence to be carried out, which was done jointly by ICLA colleagues and the livelihood and food security colleagues, just the way we did with um, the WASH colleagues. But then what was important and peculiar here with livelihood uh, um, integration was that this uh, the land was uh, to be uh, acquired for individual households. So the livelihood colleagues also supported these households to rent the land. And ICLA then stepped in to make sure that uh, fertile land was also identified and that um, the land owners were identified. So the due diligence also ensured that we identified the proper land owners or true land owners. And in the process, it was very important to secure tenure. So um, ICLA colleagues stepped in uh, to develop tenancy agreements and after these tenancy agreements were developed, uh, the meeting was organized with um, the, the owners of the land and some local authorities, as well as the wash colleague, uh, sorry, livelihood and food security colleagues. And that meeting was just for us to make sure that both parties understood the terms of the agreement. And in the course of the discussion, um, there were some terms that were modified based on uh, the preferences of the the tenants and and the the landlord. So in the end, both of them agreed on the terms after some uh, modifications were done. And so ICLA also facilitated the signing of these tenancy agreements, which of course gave um, the, the the beneficiaries some kind of uh, legal protection or guaranteed legal protection over the use of the land and that also helped uh, 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 LFS uh, colleagues to meet their objectives because most often if land is not properly negotiated um, the beneficiaries might end up being evicted even before they, they harvest their crops from the land so that is what we did and secondly we also um, worked with the LFS to empower, economically empower uh, social cohesion committees. Social cohesion committees are committees that were created in communities where the um, land management mechanism was uh, completely disrupted. And in those communities, uh, ICLA created these uh, social cohesion committees who, that was actually charged with managing HLP and ensuring collaborative disputes of um, over land that uh, displaced persons uh, had with uh, members of host communities. So um, ICLA supported these committees to function well, and uh, it, it, we, we gave them things like uh, credit cards, uh, transport, and even some resources for their mediation meetings. But then we were also thinking about sustainability, because once the project ends in 18 months, what then becomes of the, the committees? So together with the LFS colleagues, we thought we could economically empower these committees so that they could continue their activities even beyond the lifespan of the project. So together with LFS colleagues, we sat with the committees and um, while the LFS uh, colleagues um, worked with the committees to identify um, an income generating activity of their choice and also proceeded with developing a business plan for them. ICLA colleagues had to ensure the legality of this group. So we developed, ICLA developed 
the constitution uh, of the group and they proceeded with the registration of the group, which was a condition sine qua non for operating such a business in the area. So that happened so well, ICLA colleagues obtained the documentation from the, the government and uh, the LFS colleagues worked with um, the groups to come out with the business plan. And that is how we succeeded in in, in uh, setting up an income generating activities for each of the groups, which of course help to ensure sustainability. Um, but then we actually faced a lot of challenges because integration is not easy, especially when um, all the different sectors are struggling to meet their targets. So we also learned, we learned a lot from, from, from this process. The first thing is that we, we learned that, you know, when there is integration like ICLA, LFS, ICLA, it, it, it gives kind of some kind of empowerment, increased empowerment, of the beneficiaries and, and, and kind of lead to a holistic support. It also helps the, um, the, 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 the beneficiaries targeted by LFS colleagues to enjoy their rights to learn and food without being evicted even before uh, they, they harvest their crops. So um, we also learned in the process that uh, it is not always uh, very easy to carry out due diligence because it is costly. Uh, you know, from the beginning, we never thought about that. And so uh, we found ourselves wanting when it came to, you know, financing the, the entire process. So when there is such an initiative, then um, the WASH colleagues or um, LFS colleagues uh, understood that they really had to budget also more for for due diligence without which we could not succeed so um another lesson that we learned or a challenge even was that related to the cattle grazers which uh, of course they were not involved in the first discussion you know the negotiation with the communities so when we started we tried to 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 we succeeded to secure tenure through tenancy agreements but then there were still some conflicts with with grazer so we understood that in such a meeting we need to bring all of them together and another was that the lease agreements even though they were not legally binding documents but of course they actually helped to 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 uh, secure tenure for for the 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 beneficiaries because the tenants and the landlords, they both understood their rights and their responsibilities. And so it actually uh, did work <laughs> at that level. So thank you so much. Yeah, it wasn't really easy, very challenging, but to say it is worthwhile and it's very important that if we are talking about livelihood food security wash, there is no way we can't integrate HLP because all of these sectors deal with land. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julius. Uh, thank you, uh, Fernando. Anything else from you on in response to Julius' presentation? I think if there are questions from others, it's better that we, yeah. we, we give the floor to them. Otherwise, we move on to next uh, agenda items. Yeah. Sure. Well, thanks so much, both of you. Yes. Any questions, comments, response? Um, I've put there's the links in the chat. Uh, hopefully, where you can access. Uh, the infographic that Fernando was talking about. And um, yeah, I'm sure if you had questions for Julius or Fernando, they would be happy. Or put them in the chat. That's the other other place you can do things as well. Um, well, we'll give people a moment. Um, OK, well, thanks so much for joining us. And um, yeah, and, and great to hear both the. Oh, Alexandra, please come in. Sorry, finding the button again. Um, I was just wondering, so the idea of establishing a distinct committee to resolve disputes, what was sort of the logic of that um, rather than working with existing local institutions? OK, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Alexandre. I think I was expecting that question. Like I said, um, under the customary land tenure system, because Cameroon, we have both systems, that's the customary land tenure system and uh, the statutory land tenure system. 
and uh, people are more comfortable with the customary land tenure system. And in that system, uh, local authorities, or we call them the traditional councils, they are the ones that mostly resolve disputes, uh, HLP disputes. But then because of the crisis, uh, most of these uh, councils were dissolved and the people left the community. So the brave ones that were in the community, uh, we could actually sell out this idea and work with them to um, form a committee to continue resolving HLP disputes because I'll let you know that HLP disputes actually exacerbated as a result of the crisis because people knew that the uh, traditional council was dissolved. And just to let you know the composition of the committee, we had some local authorities that were still in the community. We had IDP representatives, women representative, youth representatives. So uh, typically a committee was made up of uh, about 11 to 13 members. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Julius. And yes, if any other questions come to mind, feel free to put them in the chat and we can come back. Um, and in the meantime, we will move on to the next uh, item on the agenda, which is to hear an update from our colleagues in the shelter cluster who are working on HLP issues. Um, I think, is that Melina, is that you or is it Bira here? I'm not sure, but over to you, Melina. And uh, yeah. Yes, I think it'll be me. Um, hi, everyone. Good to see you all. Uh, the updates will be quite quick. So just on the HLP e-course modules, um, the fifth e-course module has been completed and is now online. Um, Ina will be giving a more in-depth overview on that after me. We've officially started the sixth e-course module, which will focus on uh, urban informal settlements, um, HLP rights in urban informal settlements. So. Uh, we've just had the first kickoff meeting for that, and we will do a brainstorming session on this at the Global Shelter Cluster Retreat next week in Geneva. And we'll also be scheduling after that another uh, consultation for the module, so look out for that. Um, we have the HLP due diligence mini manual and um, due diligence principles update. So this is two parts, um, an update on the land rights due diligence principles from the Global Shelter Cluster. And then um, a mini manual on HLP due diligence. So it goes through the steps of HLP due diligence um, in different phases of uh, shelter programming and also tries to link to best practices um, from shelter projects. So any examples that we found of due diligence being done, um, best practices of due diligence are highlighted and linked to the case studies that are in shelter projects. So it's also um, a good resource to navigate shelter projects. Uh, we also have the Shelter HLP Toolkit, which is on the Global Shelter Cluster website, and um, that should be fully accessible by now. Um, and then we have, yeah, we participated in the conferences the last couple of weeks, the World Bank, uh, HPNW, and um, the DC and HLP Crisis Conferences, which there will also be a more, I believe Julie will be talking about that a little bit more. Um, so if there are any questions about the e-course modules, due diligence, um, Mini manual. Oh, on the mini manual, we will be um, it's just finished its first internal review. So we'll be planning a, another external initial review and consultation. Um, and this will probably be in circulation and consultation for a little while before it's ready to be published. Um, but look out for opportunity to provide feedback on that. Um, and that's all I have. Thanks, Melina. That's great. Um, yeah, on that land and shelter due diligence, I'm sure that we would all, a lot of us would love to be able to input into that. And maybe we could have a some kind of consultation or, or some kind of session where we uh, uh, look into that a bit and discuss some of the elements of it. So, yeah, thanks for the update. And yes, uh, always lots of things happening. So thank you for that. Um, Ina, are you there to give a brief overview of the new e-course module? And then we'll go to Julie after. Ina, over to you. Yes, many thanks, Tim, and hello, colleagues. And just to follow up on what Melina already mentioned on the official publication launch of Module 5 of the HLP and Displacement Interactive Training, I'm very happy to let you know that it's gone online. And I quickly wanted to show you what it looks like on the HLP AOR website. Thank you to Trezor for 
doing that magic. <laughs> um, and yeah, as already mentioned, the focus of the module um, was on protection of HRP rights in the context of climate change as a critical emerging field um, of focus um, for practitioners in the field. And what this module is trying to do, you might recall, um, for those who know, who are familiar with the training, that this training is very much focused on providing, like it provides an interactive learning environment. Right? It puts you in the shoes of a practitioner who is tasked uh, with finding a, a, a solution or like a way forward um, confronted with a specific challenge, HRP related challenge. So um, in this module specifically, what we've tried to do is to really highlight intersections of climate change related impacts on HRP rights, which of course are manifold and fundamental. Um, and then also draw attention to the fact that tenure insecure groups are among the most affected to the impact of climate change. Um, and then confronting the player, as we do in the other modules, with a quite severe challenge, which relates to um, relocation. Um, from an area that's deemed unsafe, um, as well as adaptation, strengthening adaptation measures to also support in situ adaptation, and with both having a very strong HLP component. And um, yeah, I would be very happy if many of you uh, explore the module. And thank you to everyone who's supported. Many of you are on the call, including, of course, the HLP AOR coordination team. So thank you very much for that. And very happy for any feedback you might have. And also to flag um, that we are looking at translation into other languages, including French and Arabic, which hopefully will be going online um, soon as well. So yeah, that's it from my side. And just flagging that this is on the HPR website. I will drop the link in the chat box. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sina. Thank you. And again, if in case you haven't seen the other modules, it's um, yeah, it's a good interactive way to kind of think about HLP issues and. Um, really great as a, a tool to kind of share for people as well who maybe haven't encountered what HLP issues might mean and how it might be relevant for their work as well as those of us who have a, a little bit more experience as well. Um, I was sharing with the colleagues at the um, CCCM cluster, the Camp Coordination Camp Management Cluster annual retreat last week and was um, showing them this, these training modules and they uh, went down pretty well there. So um, yeah, so thanks for that. That's great to be able to, to share those. Um, OK, yes, uh, Julie, over to you for uh, an update from the HLP in Crisis Context Conference, which took place last month. Yes, Julie, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, yes, so the second conference on housing, land and property rights in crisis context was hosted in D.C. Um, last month. Uh, we had about a day and a half of sessions, so we had a couple of panels um, focused on climate and HLP, um, how we can engage with academic stakeholders uh, recording land rights in crisis contexts. Um, and then we also focus this year on some more workshop style sessions. Um, so Alex and Miriam on this call did a session on demystifying tenure, um, a workshop that they're um, working on developing. <laughs> to kind of demystify the language um, around tenure. Uh, we also had a session on effectively advocating on HLPs. So um, kind of an initial brainstorm on a one year advocacy strategy, which um, Jim and Fernando were both involved in um, creating and facilitating. We also had a session looking kind of at digital trails, so um, how we could use people's uh, smartphone and other data to prove ownership or occupancy um, of land and housing. Uh, we also had sessions on due diligence, secure tenure principles, um, looking at how we can break down silos in HLP practice. Um, all of those really good topics. I think the um, the conversations were really engaging um, and the organizers are kind of considering now the outcomes and recommendations, which um, once it's finalized, Jim will, will share the actual document with this group, but a couple of the proposed recommendations, um, thinking about how to understand better um, how HLP rights intersect with humanitarian sectors, not just protection, not just shelter, but wash, food security, nutrition, health, etc. Um, there's been talk about hosting a roundtable conversation with both humanitarian and development actors to kind of brainstorm how those actors can collaborate from the very beginning of an emergency response. Um, 
as I said, we're we're looking at conducting collective advocacy towards humanitarian aid donors and senior humanitarian leadership. Um, looking to increase collaboration with academic stakeholders and seeking to include HLP in crisis contexts in other kind of land related conferences and communities. So the 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 final recommendation um, is we've been talking about creating kind of an online discussion space to enhance and link existing communities of practice on housing, land and property rights. Um, which I'm going to have Alex drop a very brief survey link in the chat. Um, this is something we would be really happy to have HLP AOR members involved in, but it would basically be trying to link things like the HLP AOR with interaction members with the Rights and Resources Initiative and other kind of communities of practice that already exist on land rights, but to kind of help bridge those gaps between humanitarian development, peace building actors. Um, so if you could take the survey, it'll just take you a couple of minutes very quick. Um, and yeah, as I said, Jim will share the final kind of outcomes report with everyone. And, you know, the, the organizers of the conference are all kind of volunteering to be in this little loose coalition. So we're very happy to have others um, join as interested. Thanks, Julie. Yes, um, we'll be sharing those yeah, resources as they come. And I think there will be a bumper edition of the uh, uh, the next update, which will have, I imagine, recordings and presentations and all sorts from various events that have happened recently and some new publications that are out. And just to say, if you would like to share your resources with the wider community, we've got about 600 on the mailing list around who are all you know into HLP in some way please just let us know. You can either email us or, or contact us in some other way. Um, there's lots of options now, aren't there? TikTok dance is probably a good version or maybe not. Um, and yes, Ombretta, you have your hand raised, so I'll stop talking about those things. Uh, no, thanks, Jim, and thanks, Julie, for the update. I just wanted to say um, I had the opportunity of attending some of the session of this uh, HLP conference that Julie summarized, and I think uh, one element that was um, interesting was the all the work that has been done on HLP uh, in developed countries, uh, which I think sometimes is missing a little bit from our discussions. I I think there are quite a number of actors working on housing, land and property rights of vulnerable community within, um, you know, developed countries in the West, in Europe, in the North America. And um, that uh, lessons, lesson learned and practices could also, some of them be really applicable in other more, let's say, traditional contexts where the HLP or partners work. Um, yeah, and uh, I think that was uh, was interesting to me and I learned a lot as well. Thank you and over. Thanks, Ombretta. Yes, I, I think it's I mean, it's interesting and exciting to see links being made. You know, I mean, we're all terrible for being in our silos and in our stuck in our, our boxes. So I think anything which kind of helps us push out of that and um, yeah, it is super helpful and it's encouraging to see more spaces for that um, developing um, as well. Um, great, thank you. Thanks everyone for your updates and your uh, engagement. We have actually about seven or eight minutes left in our time if, and I would love to hear from others if you would like to provide any kind of brief updates or questions or reflections or maybe something that stood out to you. Um, or if there's an issue you're working on and you'd like to hear how others are engaging with it, it um, would be great to um, either speak it out or put it in the chat. Um, I'll go through the hands as they're raised. So, Alex, you're the first one on the list, and then I'll come to you, Joseph, after. Thanks. Um, so this is actually a question for, for the entire group. So I am collaborating with some folks in Sudan where there's an enormous amount of IDPs who are settled in um, schools and other sites of public interest. And there is a pressure by local communities to reopen schools, at least in areas where there's not active conflict. And so we're looking for some of the best practices and guidance around how to support 
uh, communities to relocate with dignity and while protecting their rights and avoiding sort of forced evictions that would otherwise take place if uh, local governments just sort of uh, went in and pushed uh, people out. Uh, and so if you have any resources or guidance or uh, any any best practices that you're aware of, either humanitarian or non-humanitarian, uh, please do reach out and share those. I would really love to connect with you. Over. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, and if people want to respond to that here, they can um, either on the chat or if you want to raise your hand and, and come in. Um, similarly, if it's helpful, maybe there are people who have experience with that, but there might not be actual resources that have been produced, but maybe we can set up a conversation or, or put you in touch as well. Um, so yeah, if, if that applies to you, please um, let us know. And Alex has put his email address there in the chat. Um, I'll go through the other colleagues with the hands raised and then come back and see if others want to respond to that question. Thanks, Alex. Um, Joseph, over to you. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, just briefly, uh, I would like to share with colleagues uh, an activity that we're engaging in uh, next week in Istanbul. It's on the 12th and 13th of this month. Uh, it will be a land forum that uh, brings together our members and other allies. We're dealing with uh, HLP in various ways, whether it's land for food security, um, uh, informal settlements, uh, refugees and displaced persons, uh, restitution efforts, uh, whatever. But uh, the objective is really to build a kind of a civil society engagement uh, of a regional nature because of all of the HLP issues we have from uh, the Western Sahara to Iraq. And I'm speaking about the Middle East, North Africa region. So it, it's um, it's going to be for our members and allies, but anybody in this group who's interested, we'd be happy to invite you uh, to join remotely and send you a link. Uh, so you can uh, contact me at the email, I think at the top of the chat, or just put uh, an, a message in the chat and we'll get back to you and be happy to, uh, to welcome you to that event. Thanks. Thanks, Joseph. And that's is that the Housing and Land Rights Network? Is that right? That's right. Uh, Housing and Excellent. Land Rights Network of Habitat International Coalition. Great. Thanks so much. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, please. Yeah, let Joseph. It sounds great. Um, yes, would love to find out more about that. Um, definitely. Um, okay. Next update. So uh, Ludmilla, please come in, and then we'll go to Bwala and then Adriana, and then see where what time we're at. Hi, Jim. Thanks you all for the opportunity. I'd like to share a new tool that was published. It's already in the Global Protection Cluster page. That is the tip sheet for CVA and HLP that has been published. I'd like to, to thank everybody who took their time to participate, to collaborate, a special thanks to Alexandre, Alexandre Corrivo Burk, because he was the first to give me a very nice review about it. Thank you so much to all. Here goes the link. And there will be a second part as soon as Save the Children and the task team, well, not Save the Children only, but the task team on CVA and protection publishes it. It's a stock taking paper on the state of CVA for HLP and the training that will be held online. So this too late later are for the future. Thank you so much. Thanks. So there's the CVA tip sheet and there'll be some training coming as well online, you say. So that sounds great. Good. Thanks, Lamilla, for sharing uh, that. Thank you. Um, Voila, over to you. Uh, thanks, June. Uh, first, to, to my colleague, Alex. Um, I'm the co-coordinator of the HLP subsector in Sudan. Uh, so uh, what you mentioned uh, actually is one of the top priorities on our list to be discussed within the subsector. 
the subsector was uh, inactive due to the violent conflict in Sudan, but now, fortunately, it is uh, reactivated uh, with thanks to my colleagues uh, Ombretta and Jim, who participated in the first meeting to revive the subsector. Uh, so uh, I'd be more than happy to um, uh, invite you to the next uh, discussion, round of discussion on the same topic as uh, uh, among other topics to be discussed um, within the subsector. So if you would like so, uh, please uh, drop uh, your email in the chat and we can collaborate um, accordingly. Uh, second, I um, I would like to thank the colleague who uh, addressed the presentation on the conflict resolution uh, in the light of the dual systems of uh, land laws in, in Cameroon. We have the similar situation in Sudan, and I agree with him that uh, addressing this uh, through the customer leaders have been uh, uh, really valid in the context of Sudan. But yet, we had the issue of the do documentation of the cases. So the cases were resolved successfully, but we don't have a record for the documented cases for the future. We had some um, uh, experiences or interventions to address it through the rural courts in Sudan, but we would like to know more on uh, the documentation of such cases in a uh, similar context. Thank you, Jim. Over to you. Thanks so much, Wala. Thank you. Um, great, thanks. And I see Alex has put his uh, contact in the chat for you to follow up with. Um, and great, yeah, really good to see that the HLP coordination in Sudan is um, back and active. Um, Adriana, over to you. Thank you, Jim. It's just to answer also Alexander's comment uh, because uh, it was presented during the ICTJ meeting uh, operational guidance uh, for IDPs in this context and the chapter classic coordinator in Sudan also. So there is an operational guidance that is in review by the all coordinators. And normally, when they have received all the comments from our colleagues, uh, they will be endorsed for the acceptance of the humanitarian country team. And normally it's under revision, but uh, we expect to release this as soon as possible. But there is, um, the, it was a presentation that included the draft of this operationalization guidance. So I can share with you, you want the, the draft also. Thank you. And I invite you to assist in our cluster meetings. <laughs> Thank you, Adriana. So some operational guidance to come that you'll be able to share once uh, it, it's out. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, OK, any further comments, um, Alex? Hopefully there's been a, a helpful response there to your question. And um, yeah, great. Thanks for raising it. That's exactly what this space should be for. So that's um, great to see that and the response as well. Um, yes. So anyone else would like to say anything before I hand over to Ombretta for her final words of wisdom? Which I always like to surprise her with. No, um, Ombretta, would you like to just close for us and then we'll um, yeah, move on? Thank you, Jim. Um, yes, just thank, thanking you all for your participation, for sharing all the information. Please, um, you know, be in touch with us with uh, any information, documents, uh, information about the events that we, you would like us to share with the platform. And also, of course, be in touch with each other uh, on respective area of interest. Um, and that's it. We look forward to, to continue working with all of you in the coming weeks and months. Uh, and um, uh, see you soon in respective different platforms and then at the last at the next quarterly meeting with with additional updates. Have a good afternoon and good evening. Good morning. I don't know, depending where you are based and uh, see you next time. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. And if you'd like to put your cameras on and wave by, it's always fun. Thank you. I should have said that at the start. I will next time. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Thanks, bye. everyone.
Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ombretta. Thanks, Dim. Bye-bye. See you next See week. See you next week. Bye-bye. Cheers.